Mr. Mayor. Not yet. It's popular. Thank you. It's popular. Thank you. I have been authorized. Welcome. That's nice to have you all here and uh, sit by the fire today. Um, upcoming is uh, in December, and that will be, uh, we're going to do it an afternoon. For the, this is the Emily Dickinson birthday weekend, uh -huh. and so I'm going to have uh, Carol Weston come in if this all works out, and we're just going to spend the, the hour with her and let her work her zany, crazy, magnificent magic upon us, which is a significant thing to get some time with her. Uh, January will leave for then. Today, uh, it's absolutely wonderful to have the two of you here, and I, this is all family, so I feel like I'm talking to you, and just, <laughs> so think about this, we're sitting down at the dinner table and, and not doing a formal reading, because uh, it's, I've been aware of your work through Ed and so many other people, and seen it here and there, I, I've never been able to sit down and just let it flow over me like we're about to do, so it's a privilege to have you both here. Um, one of the things uh, for the people that are attending here uh, that I've been trying to map, when I started last year, I was simply doing a, the circles in Boston that had been pushing the, um, the word of mouth series around when I was doing that, and, uh, and that's why we ended up with Mr. Wellman here, was somebody that um, I had not gotten to word of mouth, uh, unfortunately, and to my, my ever, ever ending, you know, um, chagrin. But that's, that's the <laughs> reputation I've had to survive. <laughs> <laughs> but that, uh, I mean, having Don come in sort of launched me into um, a, a, another direction, uh, and these directions are all lightly held in my head. But what I wanted to do, I, I, I peppered people that were younger and older poets last year, all local and working here. And But when Don came in, it sort of brought in this lovely title surge uh, of what I kept thinking of as people that were not simply writing, but we're active in a, in a hugely broad way that, it, boy, it, it, it humbles me to think about the two of you and the work that you are doing in poetry, in translation, in, you know, bringing uh, the, the uh, old world, you know, to, to America, and uh, you're making films, and, uh, it, I mean, it's crazy, and uh, it's, it's something that in my uh, poetic imagination, uh, even now, when I was 20 for sure, but it still lingers that, you know, I always feel like I should be doing more. And so the example that the two of you, you know, set up for us uh, as act, simply active poets in the community, uh, broadening out to all the arts, not, you know, not a simple, narrow thing where I, I'm expressing my, you know, deep regret over the dissolving of my relationship. That's part of poetry, but there's, mm -hmm. gosh, there's a whole lot more going on. And mm -hmm. so and it's the thing that I, I love is, is you know, activity and people that are poking in every direction. So with that, let me present Barat, and we will hear your voice first. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, for inviting me <coughs> and uh, this lovely, intimate occasion, really, and uh, this amazing space. And uh, I will do exactly what you said, kind of, this is a, I'm at a dinner table, and nobody else can talk, I only can talk. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll make, I'll make the use of it, I hope. Okay. And one thing you said is very, very true about me, is that, I experienced, po I mean, I've always done it, it was not a theoretical thing, but instinctively, I experienced poetry in relation to other media, mm -hmm. constantly, you know. It was very, it, sometimes it was another language, sometimes it was another form, like painting, film, and so on and so forth. And over the years, and the 20 years, I developed a vision of poetry for myself, deriving you know, with those interests. And what I will really try to do today is give almost a kind of a shortened narrative how that developed. Because a good deal of my reading will be on my two books of poetry, The Spiritual Life of Replicants, which is based, works against the Blade Runner, the movie Blade Runner on film, and The Spiritual Life uh, and Animals of Dawn which does a similar process <coughs> against Shakespeare's Hamlet. They end up being very different works because the media against which I'm working on. And 
my journey really started. So all my work, always, my poetry always consists of responses to something else. Okay, it's always is like this. I'm kind of, when I'm talking about something, I'm talking about something else. All right, and I will start this for reading a passage from this essay, the Peripheral of Space of Photography, where for the first time I think I discovered a way of <coughs> committing an objective image outside with an outpouring of personal experience, how they can merge together, okay, where they, they, they create a fusion. The essay and basically tries to find what kind of a medium photography is at its beginning and uh, tries to find a definition for it. And this passage I'm going to read, the discussion is about a period of photography where photographers became very conscious of shadows in a photograph, different shadows, and how Photographers are responding. There are basically two kinds of responses. One is that they try to make out of the shadow is a kind of aesthetic construct, aesthetic object, you know, a work of art like a painting or so on, so on and so forth. A few other photographers kind of merged. They, are, they more, more emphasize the blur that photographer, the way the shadows are merging into each other. And my personal preference is those photographs where those mergings occur. And I will talk about one photograph, the response that I have, one single photograph, which basically is by, by Laszlo Mohal Nege, who is very much a kind of aesthetic, uh, uh, Bohas, you know, <coughs> photographer, and how a certain transformation occurs when I looked at it. One striking photograph by Laszlo Mahali Negi, decorating works, Switzerland, 1925, demonstrates my reaction to the formalist use of shadows in a photograph. This is the photograph of the wall of a modern house with a man working at the top, four windows elegantly scattered, and telephone lines leaving their shadows on the wall. The white wa wall space covering most of the photograph is striking and draws the observer into itself. I observe the wonderful wall, the windows, the chips around the frame of one of them, the shadows, the working men, and the ledge on the right, uh, and, uh, and, and the ledge on the right, and the telephone lines leave on the wall and the wonderful, wonderful empty space at the top left, which the building cannot cover. But the photograph is so conscious and proud of its formal design, so <coughs> unconscious of its mortality, that it leaves me disappointed. Everything is so pointed towards the perfection of a form, that the pho photograph does not permit me to spill into language. Perhaps what I'm saying is that I love these photographs too much, or that I'm sad that I don't love it. It does not permit me to love it enough. I leave, I feel baffled. I suddenly notice something in the picture that I had not noticed, but I had noticed but not verbalized before. Three of the windows are bare, but a fourth on the left has decoration around itself. And the, what the worker is doing, hanging bef before the top window, is decorating it. He will go down then to each bay window and decorate it with the same flower design. Decorating work in the title does not refer to the formal aesthetic of the photograph, but the worker's activity. This realization transforms these photographs for me. First of all, it gives the worker a pose, independent from the photographer and his form formalist aesthetic. 
and starts a dialogue between the worker and me, the observer, pushing the photographer aside. The worker will go to the next window and the next and decorate them all with flowers. The experience of the passage of time is sweetly mixed with a freedom of gesture. I also realize the not yet drawn pretty designs are the bare windows, always existent in one window and half in another, are part of the dialogue among windows, objects in the photograph, one decorative design being the shadow, the reflection of another window, and that interaction between the worker and the window is an ongoing process creates the interior dialogue emanating from the photograph, which gives this photograph its mysterious power beyond the photographer's intentions and the observer's conscious understanding. In fact, the pretty decorations are somewhat in contradiction to the building's minimalist Le Corbusier facade and the photographer's formalist Bohas aesthetics. That, contra that contradiction brings in the rich life of this photograph. And uh, uh, I will, since a good deal of my work is, uh, is a translation from Turkish poetry, but since I'm co focusing today on, on my own work, what I will do, I will read two pieces. I'm preparing a book of a Turkish poet, a complete manuscript. I've been working on it about four or five years now. Like, a fantastic poet. His name is Sami Baydar. He, you know, he died very young. And uh, the anthology has a number of his poetry. I will, I, I will read two of them. Virgin River. To bathe in your water between your face in your hair, a hand must be. Waters are alive, medley to love, links and links. I can't tell, is it rose? Is it house? Hase. I can't make it hurt. Your loving kiss is like a mask glued to my face. To pull them out in memories, hair of torture. The milk lotus won't bloom in water. Go figure. That's why waiting for this moment is beautiful. As if one single sparrow left its tail fly. The second one is called No One Home. When my wife cried, my servants told her to keep quiet as I, while they kiss her hand, <coughs> see it in the mirror. They embraced my wife, daughter, making them drink herbs. I saw it in the mirror. She is sleeping. They worship her by her bed. Together, when I turn my back, I don't see what they are doing. Before my wife, my servant puts his forehead to the ground. From his back, the top of a creature is emerging, who listens to my wife like a child. That's what they say. I know my wife is pleading with me on the floor. But I see her climbing someone in the mirror. Sadly, I love her. My love lifts the weights from her body, and she, growing light, can approach me as a servant sees the blood on the floor. I see her crying in the mirror. The servant is climbing down the stairs in the mirror. I see a postman arriving. The servant says, there's no one home.
So, most of the reading I'll do from the spiritual life replicas and um, Animals of Dawn. Uh, as I said, the spiritual life replica is based, is, is, a, is kind of interacts with the film Blade Runner. I don't know, is there anybody who is not familiar with the film? <laughs> okay, so everybody knows. Okay, so replicants are those robots, you know, kind of shit. Yes. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, it's and, yeah, and kind of robots suddenly they realize they are going to die very soon and they don't like it. So the whole movie basically <laughs> is they're trying to kind of fight mortality. <coughs> and uh, uh, I am not really as much interested about describing the movie or kind of making cute jokes about it, making references to it, but rather how that film is constructed. What is a film language? How film really became, how can film language, as a matter of fact, my real concern is how can film language can become the language for a book, for a poem, and this is really the experiment. Behind it also, kind of some of the poetics of Turkish poetry, they, they merge together. And uh, I will read just a little bit from this, from the afterwards of the of the of the poem that might be a little somewhat helpful. <coughs> oh, by the way. The, the visual element in some of these poems is very important. One has to look at the poems, okay? So that I kind of spread yeah. some, you know, you can really spread this. From the poems I'm going to read, to the ones that have a visual dimension, I spread some things that you can look at them. You know, so yeah, that's what you know. Uh, that's a nice yeah, I'm assuming in your references to the film you're talking about the first film, not the new one. No, not no, no, this one. is the first one. Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen the new one yet. It's really good. Yeah. It's worth the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I did yes, but you know, I don't want to be a snob about it. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Yeah. Okay. okay, I'll just read it a, 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 a little bit. It might help kind of to orient the poem. Really. The title of the afterwards is A Few Thoughts on Fragments. The poem, The Spiritual Life of Replicants, is infused with Sufi ideas. And this infusion results in a poetry that consists of movements of thought in a visual field. The reader experiences the movements as he or she is ensnared by them reading the poem. The thought patterns are arabesque, circuitous, tangential, reflecting the Sufi sense that the reality is not st stared at directly, but it can only be touched, glimpsed at reflectively as fragments, the way, for instance, the reality of the wind can be seen or heard in the traces of it leaves or the movements of branches. In this way, the infinite, the invisible, the music of silence descends to visibility. The primary struggle for the poet in the spiritual life is to create a spectacle in which words, language, can act freely, following impulses inherent in them. Basically, each page becoming a scene in which, in different constellations, words enact their drama. The primary unit in this enactment is a, is a fragment. A fragment is like a lyric poem or an epigram in length, but is de devoid of any lyric persona, no lyric I, replacing it in the poem with the mechanical eye of a lens, a photographic lens. In the process, the distinction between human and non-human, organic and non-organic, thought and sensation disappears. <coughs> enabling fragments to move across party lines. Fragments are thoughts afloat. Whenever kind of one of the poems, you'll see it if you, 
that as I read some of them out of, of the paper, you know. Imagining death is before all imagining the eye's absence. The absent soul tracing these transformations. What cinematography means, writer of movement, Stan Brackage. Ergo, death is the death of the cinematographer. A writing of the eye's movement disappearing. It's calligraphy. Burial of what is seen in silent Rayograph, emotion of light without the camera obscura, two photons colliding into each other. The most intense form of silence is hearing, as insomnia is the precarious longing for sleep, eyes leading to blindness. I feel all men seeingly in the calligraphy of sudden thoughts. Steam, steam is one of the poems there. Steam, varnish and vanessing pink, full of sweat, beats, drum, uh, ask, burying into Muriel's, burial, Muriel into swan and swarm, birds, horse and hazy, lazy house, seen in cerule cerulean blue tile, walls of, Seductive hot bathhouse, lazy house, seen, solemn, solemn, and cloud of misting, but not solo, Jack. Scum. A bird flies a straight white path in the eternal agitations of the sky, like a baby, sweet, its jewels showing. The theft. What death steals from us is our soul, the eluding traces of consciousness. In that respect, it is the motherfucker of all photographers. The paparazzi we must all endure in our 16 seconds of solitary pain. Luc Godard speaking directly in masculine feminine. Yes, in a way, we are at the center of the world. We speak with our lips. We see with our eyes. We think with our thoughts. The interviewee should decenter himself. The interviewee should not look at the lens but if the other person asking the question heard around the lens, Luke Godard. The next one is a bit. Yet, yet, the ejaculatory force of the eye, my darling, to Elsie. The whole thing is about sex and the body's relation to consciousness. You stay to my left and listen to breathing. As he breathes, as you, and you breathe, and you imagine a bird is flying in the room, and you tremble in anxiety, and think that at the center where you are, at the umbilical facade of this room, which at first seems a library, or it stacks, a loveliness is breathing, and the bird flying in the room is reading <coughs> all these books to our exquisite regret and love's appreciation. In this mathematical motion of consciousness, the room echoes in its own sounds. What for the eye must not do What's for the eye must not duplicate what's for the ear, each being the rabbit chasing the other, led leading the leader, 
against the tactics of speed, of noise, set the tactics of slowness. A triangle entered the room with lips of a beast in distress, crouched. I gazed into it, sweat on my brow. I feared the resilience of the coil uncoiling on three feet, violent and more unpredictable than the leap of a warm panther. I touched the lines and caressed them. The triangle and the river. A triangle obfuscating before rituals of sleep, insomniacs, delusions, in hardline geometry, let the stream swamp you, let, let, oh how often. Blame me if I am unto you, triangle, the angular lunge of your arms is a bill plucking. Screams, it's axiom axiomatic, the muzzle dream progressing only under water, emerging as waves, tsunami waves. Lick the tip of, of your apex, masturbate outside the river. In masculine feminine, the audience knows everything about the noises outside the frame. The flow of the traffic, pinball clings, pop songs, etc. An argument why she should turn from him to him. An argument why she should turn from him to him. An argument why she should turn from him to him. Fini is feminine. This is. There's a footnote there, it's on your page. And, uh, I and Godard, the crush on Karina. For Godard, she exists, I think. God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because I do not exist. Oh, I less in Gaza. No, hairless in Gaza. It's basically, let's say, I think I'll just give one more piece here. That's, that's I think that's what. Uh, Wings in the foliage, wings in the foliage, behind the wall. Okay. Here, animals of dawn, it's kind of a different poem because spiritual life is dealing with a film. Okay, so basically, the medium against which we have is a visual medium. Hamlet is a verbal medium. Okay, so the kind of movements thought that I'm talking about has to be resolved in a different way. And uh, what really happens, I will just here. Here I develop the idea of commentary. Okay, so I read just one paragraph, I think, a few, then I read a number of pages from the beginning. Hamlet is a holy text that is at the heart of things. Of animals of dawn. Almost every piece in the poem is a commentary, a riff of thought, a speculative argument, a parallel alternative text, a counter argument or counterfact, turning around a specific word or phrase, a disjointed twisting of fact or a suggestive elusive echo that occurs in the peripheries of the reader's, listener's mind out of the focus of the linearity of the main action, the revenge in the play. One of the captions to the poem is a quotation from T.S. Eliot's essay on Hamlet. It's 
to say that you said I find it. Oh yeah, that's what the T.S. Eliot says. So far from being Shakespeare's masterpiece, the play is most certainly an artistic failure. So, mm -hmm. so this is this is also hopefully a poem for of failure. So, yeah. animals of dawn. I want to make Hamlet to disappear. The lightning that didn't strike made me disappear completely. And her arms unknowingly caresses the water wall. Haiku, haiku, hai. Ku, haiku, haiku, haiku. Haiku, haiku, hai. Plop, frog, circles disappearing, infinite. Until I touch her, my sister gave hope. But her corpse was heavy out of water. Don't touch the translucence, they turn into wind crumbs. Oh God, I could live in an oyster and count myself belonging to infinite space. But I have bad dreams. <coughs> Denmark is a prison. Your ambition makes it so. The Chain of Numbers, Sex, dedicated to Stefan Malarme. This poem has only six letters, is made of six <coughs> letters, okay? Basically corresponding to the six numbers of the die, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. So. One, a door, six. Two, a door, five. Three, a door, four. Four, Ardors, three, five, radar, two, six, order, one, seven, le hasard, executed at each throw of the die, disappears, le hasard, imprisoned in each throw of the die. Dracula, Horatio, I'll cross it though it blast me, stay illusion, speak to me. Existence is a very rare event, out of the infinities that don't happen. These lines are about the left out and their liberation. The non-existent, you have nothing to lose but your walls. Russet mantle. Unfold thyself. Who is it? Run your comb through the hair of the night. It's bitter. The hour line approaches a ghost. At 12 p.m. all drinks will turn. At 12 p.m. all drinks are wine. Radical erasure. The experiment connected to death. Who is it? I can't remember. After a dream, facts are the morning dew. I'm sick at heart. The bird of dawning singeth all night long. Star ghost. Infinity is there, there. A twinkle in my dad's eye. And I'm alive, and he's dead. Jackson Pollock. Time, a spray of colors, there only when it's looked at, following the rhythms of attentions, the eyes recalcitrant, incorrigible darts, every instant a variant color, past, present, and future of a distant, self-penetrating dream. A dream within a dream, like cockroaches, images, facts, hide into themselves. Only when lightning switched to light the darkness, 
Arcing in word I, John Tantalus. M-I-R, uh, M-I-R here is spelled as A-M-A-R-E and I. Uh, machine gun, machine gun, machine gun, cha-cha-cha. Machine gun, machine gun, machine gun, cha-cha-cha. Turn over. Machine gun, machine gun, machine gun, cha-cha-cha. Machine gun, machine gun, machine gun, cha-cha-cha. Turn over. The Matisse circle. As in a Matisse painting, the unreals hold hands and dance around the fireless fire. Conversation among unreals is what idea is. Cut out into the green valley entered the short-winged bird. Let me see. Okay, I'll write just two or three more pages. One, bars, as the birds fly against the notes flapping blue, notes escaping towards horizon. Two, bars, as the birds fly against the notes flapping blue, notes escaping towards horizon. Manifesto, music imprisons the angel of <coughs> chaos into its bars doesn't imitate time, compensates for its absence. Sing, sing, a bird called flying prison. In the tree of pears, P-A-I-R-S, R-S, in the tree of pears, numbers are flying. Oh, the bears eating from trees, bearing fruits, from the thorn in bloom, the slowly melting dew, absent. Cinema verite zombie. Non-existing being a state of being, it appears in the film reel. God is that being whose essence is non-existing. In her last forbidden caresses, a weeping, Dreamboat, sleek like otters fresh out of water, streaking, oh, dripping on my sighs. Thank you very much. Please, Paul, what's your balance? All right. Continue this magnificent. Everybody warm enough? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Alright, so I'm going to be moving through centuries with these translations. Um, I think it was Char reading Charles Olson's uh, dance play that got me interested in Apollonius of Tyana. So I'll just read uh, Apollonius of Tyana's um, letter to the Stoic philosopher Euphrates. Uh, if any student is in a position to speak with a Pythagorean and to ask him what knowledge he would derive from studying with him. I would tell him this, he will gain knowledge of legal matters, geometry, astronomy, mathematics, knowledge of harmony and music and of the art of medicine. All aspects of divination, he will become like a god and even more importantly he will learn the qualities of being generous and forgiving. His soul will become elevated, he will achieve glory and endurance, he will revere and gain direct knowledge of the gods, not based on mere opinion, but in fact. And he will directly observe the world of daemons and not base his conclusions on mere faith. He will befriend both, realizing that in one respect both God and daemon are the same. He will derive an independence of spirit, he will learn to persist in his studies against great odds. He will be frugal, find that he can live on little but basic needs. His perception will be sharpened and quick. His movements unhindered and forceful. His body will acquire a healthy color. He will be courageous in all things with an eye to the final goal, which is immortality. Now, have any of your followers, Euphrates, learned anything such as that which I have spoken of that they could use in order to acquire knowledge of the true philosophy? I imagine that they have acquired nothing but the sight of your great wealth. 
and that is yours alone. Okay, these are some Pasolini poems from the early 70s, uh, from a manuscript that's um, been uh, uh, rarely translated, uh, um, and uh, it's called The Hobby of the Sonnet. And uh, so, it's, I mean, it's a very interesting manuscript because it really is Pasolini totally vulnerable over a young man, and that, that's kind of um, rare, I think, in Pasolini's work. I mean, we tend to think of him as a civic poet. Um, so anyway, so uh, Pasolini, these are untitled. Your stay, has, your stay has been legendary. You are gone now and your bed is still unmade. Not an hour has passed since you said, smiling, bow low, you were half undressed, bow low with that humor that shines in the eye of a poor man who is nonetheless wise, who is able to be happy alone. You repeated in your funny way a cafe latte in hand, and your stomach still empty before breakfast. You repeated my words of last night, bow low, you said, and a minute later, just and just like this, do you want to see me anymore? And you waited, hiding your anxiety. I smiled. Yes, if you want to, I responded as I lay in bed, and you swear it, and so I did. I said, oh, if I'm strong enough, my dear Nato, uh, and then you laughed. Two. It is said a boy who is 23 years old has a right to love a girl, a certain Patrizia of a good family of the people, with their weeping black eyes and thin wrists. There is no one that does not see in this love all that is beautiful and traditional. They are on your side, in their hearts they retain no pity for the man that remains behind, abandoned and alone. But reality is elsewhere in the net, though. This love does not glorify you, it humiliates you. You are at bottom jealous of her. It is she who can blackmail you for your previous love that was innocent. You love her only if she weeps and is humiliated. You don't know how to maintain her, nor do you really want to. This thought of Nanetto, when I return to it, which is at least a hundred times a day, gives certainty to a way of life, but it was a fable I told myself, half believing the words, my cute one. It was a term I used with my mother. An unutterable joy trembles inside me. It's, it is an affection that causes the ice in my heart to melt. My life was eternally committed to her familiar face. Now thoughts of Nanetto return. He is like a figure from a crazy dream a fugitive animal who ran away but who now returns to the flock. Perhaps I am the one you really want, but the day will come when you, intense in both directions, will come to a decision and I will be on the loser's end, alone, totally alone and tired, so very tired. After a long absence, I put on a record of Bach, inhale the fragrant earth in the garden, I think again of poems and novels to be written, and I return the silence of the morning rain, the beginning of the world of tomorrow, around me are the ghosts of the first boys, the ones you knew, but that is over, their day has passed, and like me, they remain far from the summit where the sun has made glorious their heads, crowned with those absurd modern style haircuts and those ugly American jeans that crush <laughs> the genitals. You laugh at my Bach and you say you are compassionate. You speak words of admiration for my dejected brothers of the left. But in your laughter, there's the absolute rejection of all that I am. Uh, the pagan and the modern. <clears throat> I dream of some desolate city of the Po, surrounded by large white stones and vast natural gardens. The sky seems an unusual shade of blue pure as the sun that scorches my face. I am of a pagan race, ancient and untouched by the modern world. I am Orpheus, Oedipus, Medea, Narcissus. The mythical landscape is real. The gods are alive. I wake in the middle of a sentence, look from the window above my desk, littered with pages for an unfinished novel, and see a pack of boys running in the crowded street. They blend with the images and sounds of this new world. I am overcome then by a vague feeling that something real has died, never to return. Okay, so this is a, a section from an abandoned manuscript, a screenplay actually of Pasolini's from 1963. Um, and blasphemy uh, is personified, but it's clearly in the, in the voice of Pasolini. 
Many of you, before the light is extinguished, will deny my words, and therefore life will be on your side. A young girl asks, Are you not grateful for your life? Life is not something that can be taken or given away. I renounce life, and thus my death shall not bear fruit. This is not life. An old woman weeping, but you don't care if you leave us. God does not give me strength, and I will try to restrain myself and keep from weeping. Next to boy, why doesn't God give you strength? Because I'm not worthy. And who is worthy among us? One who loves life. Love life with its death, death, suffering and death, its tears? Yes, because you gain strength from these tears. And who will not die simply because he denies you? Death will come, and with it tears. God weeps too for mankind. Your strength is from his tears. And what is your strength? I have no strength. I am weak. Because you are so different from us? No, so as to love and know God. And for this he will not reward you? He is a curse upon my life. And why does he curse you? Because I wish to be blessed by a man. And what is it the fate of a man who desires to be blessed by men and not God? The will to die. By the hand of God? No, by the hand of a man. Because instead the others will kill you? Because he makes us doubt the reality of this life. Since one does not know purity, one remains ignorant of the impurities. Therefore we do not have words for these men. His love threatens life and those who do not know love of the body or the intellect are most dear to God, who is more manifest when there is less anxiety about him. These people must save their life, but you love all people. You are not men, but martyrs to God. Only in this way does he make himself known to those who are dear to him. So speaks blasphemy with his companions, besides the fire that illuminates the sweet night for those who do not believe that life has a purpose. I'm sorry, I just need some water. Can I have a long yes. piece coming through? <laughs> Big bottle, then there's soda water next to it. Oh, uh, yeah. translating the uh, large, um, huge work, uh, which I've titled The Visionaries, uh, which is, uh, um, hasn't been translated really before, and I'm engaging on the whole 500 pages of it. I think it's a central text of Nerval's, <coughs> the limited translators for one reason or another over, over many years. So this is um, revolutionary mysticism, uh, the precursors, and, and this is just a, um, a short section. Uh, you're going to hear the word, uh, I just, I just want to know, you're going to hear the word la philosophie, la philosophie and um, uh, speaking, uh, you know, speaking with uh, Garrett, uh, Garrett Lansing about the term and Nerval's relation to the term, I, I, um, he really sort of um, made me aware that Nerval's use of the word has many meanings. Uh, it doesn't merely, it certainly shouldn't translate to philosophy or even hermetic or occult philosophy is sufficient, but it actually refers to the alchemical gold and, and also to the uh, Knights Templar and many other things. Uh, so, Nerval. Um, Christianity's prolonged contact with the East during the Crusades brought over another large similar uh, number of ideas which moreover found themselves easily supported by the local traditions and superstitions of the European nations. The Templars were among those Crusaders who endeavored to achieve the broadest possible alliance between these Eastern ideas and those of Roman Christianity. In the, desi in the desire to establish a link between their order and the Syrian people they were responsible for governing, they laid the foundations for a new kind of doctrine that was engaged with all the religious pra religions practiced by the Levantines without abandoning, in essence, the Catholic synthesis, but by often making it bend to the requirements of their position. These were the foundations of Freemasonry, 
which were connected to similar institutions established by various sects of Muslims and which still survive persecution, especially in the Haram and Lebanon and Kurdistan. The strangest and most exaggerated phenomenon of these Eastern associations was the famous order of the assassins. The nation of the Druze and that of the Ansari are the only other ones today who have guarded the last remnants of it. The Knights Templar were soon accused of having established one of the most formidable heresies that Christianity had ever witnessed, persecuted and finally destroyed in all the European country, countries through the combined efforts of the papacy and the monarchies. They had on their side the intelligent classes and the many distinguished minds who were against the abuses of the feudal lords. They were what we, we, we would call today the opposition. From their ashes, Scattered to the wind, there was born a mystical and philosophical institution which greatly influenced that first moral and religious revolution that for the people of the north was called the Reformation and for those in the south of France, La Philosophie. These reforms were still moreover concerned with the salvation of Christianity as a religion. Occultism, however, gradually became its enemy and aiming especially at those who remained Catholic, soon established, established clear divisions, gulfs between unbelievers and believers. However, there are many who are not satisfied with pure materialism, but who, without rejecting the religious uh, tradition, prefer maintaining toward it a certain freedom of discussion and interpretation. It was they who formed the first Masonic societies, which soon gave shape to the popular corporations, and what are still today called trade guilds. Okay, here's this, uh, these are just a, a, um, a few poems on um, uh, ancient themes, <coughs> ancient uh, themes, ancient poetry, themes of ancient poetry. Uh, so, four. Flowers bloom in the newly born earth. Now is the right time to sacrifice to the gods. Men gather around the sacred temple, burn sacrificial animals, the blood drained by the sacred earth as thick black smoke rises to the sky. The priests bow down before the temple arch as they utter the solemn words of prayer, invoking the terrible God. Drunk on the divine, we marvel at such splendor as the handsome God appears out of the shadows with his delicate features pretty as a girl. 41. In this decadent age, the sins of the fathers pass to the sons, the countless dead litter the bare fields. Whom is this violent age spared from grief? What sins have we not tried, thinking to achieve good through evil means? Witness what these young men have done, not fearing the wrath of the gods and the altars they left barren. For to and I beg you, change the scales in our favor, take our blunt knives and sharpen them on Vulcan's anvil, and let us turn them on our enemy instead of ourselves. Listen, a god speaks in the voice of that young boy over there. Look, see the blue smoke rising up all around him. Listen closely to him. He speaks of your future. Thirty-three, uh, Icius, I can see you love this sweet-scented boy of the Arabian palace. You are seduced by these jewels and rare gems that are strewn about his bedroom and that hang from his thin neck and his exquisite scent and his deep red lips and his blue radiant eyes. But beware, the gods say you will meet your death at his hands. Okay. Uh, Okay, I'll read something from my um, sci-fi, some sci-fi here, uh, um, these series of poems. Uh, Exterminating Angel One. Meanwhile, in the Imperial City, heaps of useless computers, iPhones, automobiles, Clothes, stereos, CDs litter the sidewalks, spilling into the streets. Urban violence on the rise spreads to suburbia. 
a term with virtually no meaning these days. When anyone speaks about personal safety, human rights, or the law, laughter can be heard for miles. Fresh indictments vomit up new hate in back rooms of justice. Strange cultural malaise gives new life to brutality, ignorance, and rage. It is as if the sun had been sucked into a black hole. Or was it that the garbage had piled too high for anyone to see clearly what was at the end of their fork? Exterminating Angel 2. Never the middle ground, grinning personalities, out of control, fear on the rise, barricades on street corners, searchlights 24-7, scan each corner of this imperial city, fingers working overtime, hastily programming endless series of profiles, analyzing data coming in at a furious rate, sketching the face of guilt. Knowledge freezes all systems down when confronted by unspeakable crimes. Exterminating Angel 3. Illicit business deals oil the economic wheel, outsource the key word, implement new models with short half-lives on the market, permit import-export of artillery and pernicious drugs for distribution in impoverished areas where enthusiastic crowds cheer the young boy who's finally become a man, his face splattered with, with blood, his eyes uh, swollen, his ribs broken. Exterminating Angel 4. Bad information on public display. Political organizations recruit fresh young men out of college to retrain down the hall. Intelligence is measured, tested, retested, then the psychological profile. Question after question after question. Tell me about yourself. How, how would you answer? What would you say? What about yourself? What, 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 uh, uh, what wouldn't you say? This is how they substitute you for another with your own consent, give you the stamp of approval or not. Of course, there are always those who don't meet the grade. It's an unavoidable product of systematic drill, but don't worry your little head, your discharge will be honorable. <coughs> Exterminating Angel 6. Ruthless investments continue in the outside world where speculative frenzy is at a maximum. A roll of the dice, millions down on the table, the president's fist adorned with gold rings. Advertising unable to stop generating false pleasures. Feeding on a population whose fantasies threaten to repla replace reality. Senators masturbate over possible gains in world domination. Orgasms of superiority and hysterical arrogance. Reality cluttered with illusions of a better, brighter world. Accessible from your computer, uh, computer screen. Google, Facebook, Yahoo, safe in your home, and while the infrastructure is rotting near the oil pumps and the water in some areas is undrinkable. Uh, exterminating Angel 7. Principia misogynistic, noble profile. The masses don't feel pain. Rictus, horrible, degenerate incest. Lucia in the Valkyries of Wagner. Ice Swan. Pounds of caviar, Masonic Hermeticism, Angel or Beast out of Darkness. Uh, okay, uh, Exterminating Angel 8. Fear and desperation spawn a belief in false, myth, myth, false myth and fetishes. Kabbalah, chicken feet, and washable rubber virgin, brutal rituals of human sacrifice. We've had the habits and proclivities and tastes of imperialists, so we've colonized what we thought of as the strong sounds in nature while leaving a whole spectrum unnoticed. The tears of the gentle fascists have spoken face to face with death. Okay, well, let me, re I'll just read my, my latest work, project here, or translation, the translating of a translating a younger poet, uh, Italian poet in Lausanne, and uh, lives in Lausanne. So uh, these are drafts, um, but I'll test them out. Um, Pierre Lepori, three. My love, where are you going? You who always leave when I turn my back. You who leave and disappear. But your breath on my neck is not a dream. This is the disciplined life. The ardor, the little of me that remains. When I look at you, I do not see you. 
When you look at me, you do not see me, my love that is a simple name in the rise and fall of the hours. O light of day, please make the words simple, for the clear water leads to my lover who hides himself between the folds, either solemn or chaste, clear as the obvious adjective, as the voice in the song, and the illusions increasingly lightweight, less cluttered with platitudes. Then the night takes me, it turns me around with its hands and it spits, it washes me, covering my chest with hot snow. My love is bitter, and in, in, in my love his voice resides, unaware of distance. Hopelessly he repeats the words, without fear of the white canvas of the wear and tear of time. Here everything is suspended and subtle in the shortcut to dream between the silence and the voice, between what exists in a thought and the occurrence of skin, even on the page. Uh, the, the, quote, uh, the quote appears from Pierre Bourdieu's Language and Symbolic Power. It's, uh, it is not true that the words create facts. It is not true that the words, I wanted to tell you this, my love, but life in itself is not enough. Either it is vainly constructed, withholding all the facts, it trembles as the stones that bounce twice on the surface of the water and then disappear. And it's the last poem I'll read. My lover is tough in the yellow city light in the rain. My lover fakes indifference and crosses his legs. He doesn't even know that I'm watching him and looking at him. I recreate him with a tiny crease, almost a cut above the eye and the side swept bangs. Then suddenly the words are missing and his face evaporates. The hands slip away, Orpheus. Food and wine. You need something. You can like tell. Yeah. 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 If anybody's there, I can transfer from Bezier. I left the door open. It's unlocked. Okay. 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 Of the nail baroque surrealist style. Near about the very important nail. Love for a man. 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 Love for a